want to get into this message today. Uh, actually, I want to call this message the countdown. The countdown. How many of you know that life is a game with a clock, but you have no idea how much time is on the clock? None of us. You know, we, uh, we've all seen either movies of games or we've seen the actual game where it all comes down to that last second shot and the shot is made and the game is won and everybody applauds and screams and yells and it's so much fun. You know, whether it was Michael Jordan or Kawhi Leonard with that last that one that bounced around the rim or uh, Steph Curry's or uh, whoever it might have been. We've all seen those and probably most guys here, I don't know about the girls, the guys have probably played it through in our minds as kids uh, in the, on the driveway at the house, you know, three, two, one. We, should, we, we know that. We love that. That's fun. It's exciting. But life itself is a game. You just can't see the clock. It's got a clock. You just can't see it. Hebrews 9.27 says, just as people are destined to die once after that to face judgment. King James says, it's appointed unto man once to die after that the judgment. And in Job chapter 14, verse number five, it says this, a man's days are numbered. You know the number of his months. God, you know the number of his months. He cannot live longer than the time you have set. And that's why procrastination is an enemy that every single one of us have to defeat. You know, the, the worst regrets that most people have in their life as they get older is how much time that they've wasted. And most of the time, the greater regrets are not the things that we've done. It's the things that we haven't done things that we failed to do, things that we put off for a different time but never got around to it. I know most of us, we're probably pretty good at procrastinating. I can do it without even thinking about it. It's just, it just comes natural. So we have to defeat this thing called procrastination. Somebody said, if good things come to those who wait, why is procrastination a bad thing? Well, it just, it's a bad thing, and I'm going to prove it to you today. In Psalms 39, verse number four, here's what David said. Lord, remind me how brief my time on earth will be. Remind me that my days are numbered, how fleeting my life is. You've made my life no longer than the width of my hand. My entire lifetime is just a moment to you. At best, each of us is but a breath. And even James, in James 4.14, he says, our life is a mist. It appears for a while and then it vanishes. Our life is like a vapor, here for a moment and then it's gone. That's why Paul said in Ephesians 5.15, be careful then how you live, not as unwise, but as wise, making the most of every opportunity because the days are evil. Someone once not too long ago decided to do a survey of the Bible and try to come up with uh, some superlatives, scriptures that match certain superlatives. And they, they wanted to find out like what the words in the Bible, the happiest word in the Bible, the saddest word in the Bible. And they determined that the most dangerous word in the Bible is the word tomorrow. Tomorrow. Tomorrow is the most dangerous word in the Bible because it robs dreamers of their dreams. It robs students of their educational opportunity. It robs fathers of time with their children. It robs people of the opportunity to say yes to Jesus. It robs people of eternity. It robs people of salvation. Satan's favorite word is tomorrow. Tomorrow. If he can get you thinking that tomorrow is something that you can bet on, something you can bank on, something that you can depend upon, then he has you right where you want, where he wants you. It's like the guy with the gas station that says, has a sign that says, free gas tomorrow. And every day you come back. And why? It's always put off one more day. That's what Satan does to us. That's why we have to make sure that we are responding today. The Bible says today is the day of salvation. Today. Any businessman, any salesman will tell you that the art of succeeding is knowing what to do, when to do it, and doing it at that moment. But we still have this problem of putting things off. We still have the, we fall into the trap and we fall into that temptation of just waiting for another opportunity for another day. If you've got your Bibles or your phones, I want you to look at this scripture, Acts 24, verse number 22. It'll be on the screen, 
But I want you to see this. Acts 24, verse number 22. It says, then Felix, who was well acquainted with the way, the way is the, speaks of the New Testament believers, those who are following Jesus in the New Testament era. Felix was the governor of Judea at that time. So Felix, the governor who was well acquainted with the way, adjourned the proceedings. And when Lysias, the commander comes, he said, I will decide your case. He ordered the centurion to keep Paul under guard. Paul was locked up for preaching the gospel. And uh, he said, keep him under guard, but give him some freedom, permit his friends to take care of his needs. Several days later, Felix came with his wife, Drusilla, who was Jewish. Now, Felix and Drusilla together were a bad couple. They were, they were actually in an immoral relationship. Uh, she had left her husband to marry him. Uh, Drusilla herself, her father, Herod Agrippa, was the one who murdered James and attempted to murder Peter. Her great uncle was the one who, Herod Antipas, Antipas who was the one who uh, beheaded John the Baptist. Her great grandfather was the one, uh, Herod the Great, who murdered all the children under two years of age, trying to kill the baby Jesus. So she's got a very dark spiritual ancestry. So these two together were bad. It says that they sent for Paul and they listened to him as he spoke about faith in Christ Jesus. As Paul talked about righteousness, self-control, and judgment to come. Now think, here's Paul's message to this very evil couple. Righteousness, self-control, and judgment to come. I mean, he was hitting them right between the eyes. Now, what Felix was doing is Felix was bringing Paul before him almost like a courtroom and giving him an opportunity to defend himself. But instead of defending himself, he just stood up there and talked about his faith in Jesus Christ and began to preach a message of righteousness, self-control, and judgment to come. And what he was telling them is there's a judgment that's coming. And there's a judge who sits on a throne that's bigger than your judge, bigger than your throne, uh, Felix. And he was, I mean, just giving it straight to them. Well, look what happens. It says, as Paul talked about righteousness, self-control, and judgment to come, Felix was afraid. Some verses say that he was terrified. What does that mean? It means that he was convicted by the Holy Spirit. We don't hear a whole lot about that much anymore. People get convicted. They, they, they don't respond like this. They, 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 they go to another church. But it says that he was, uh, he was convicted. He was afraid. And what he said was, he said, that's enough for now. You may leave. And notice this. When I find it convenient, I'll send for you. At a more convenient time, I'll send for you. In other words, he said, I don't want, I want to listen to this right now. And I know people do that all the time. That's why they'll just go to another church and wait for a more convenient time to come back. But notice this. It's at the same time, he was hoping that Paul would offer him a bribe, so he sent for him frequently and talked with him. So he kept him coming back, but he never really responded under that conviction. That conviction didn't happen again. And it says in verse 27, when two years had passed, Felix was succeeded by Festus, but because Felix wanted to grant a favor to the Jews, he left Paul in prison. Now, Paul is preaching straight to Felix, straight to Drusilla. He's telling them they're going to be held account for their sins. This had to be some kind of a sermon. It made them feel so uncomfortable. He sent him away, said, I'll send for you again in another time. The only problem is the Bible never shows us that that time ever came. The Bible never says that Felix finally came around and responded to that conviction of the Holy Spirit. That moment when Felix could have had those fears relieved, that moment when he could have settled everything once and for all, he chose not to. You see, he put off the most important and probably the most difficult task ever, and that is settling things with God, making things right with God. It's not an easy decision. It's not a comfortable decision, but it's the most important decision that you'll ever make. And he put off this decision for another time. I want you to think just for a few minutes here about the way procrastination hinders different areas of our life. Think about how it hinders. I'm going to get in your business now. How about wait? Wait. Oh, yeah, yeah. We put off getting our weight under control, right? Thank you for one complimentary amen. Nobody wanted to say anything. We do. We put it off. Well, I'll wait until 
the first of the year. We'll do it at the first of the year because who wants to mess with it during holidays, right? So we, we keep putting off. And then that, that commitment lasts for about, what, about two weeks? And, and then we're out. And then it's all of a sudden, okay, got it ready for summertime. So we start you know, trying to get in shape. We try to get things. Well, we just keep procrastinating, procrastinating. How about just our overall health? I'm going to eat right. I'm going to get back in that gym. So we buy that gym membership. Come on, how many of you have a gym membership you don't use? Let me see. Come on, come on, come on. Yeah, all over the place, all over the place. Why? Because we procrastinate actually going to the gym. How about our finances? We procrastinate saving or spending properly or budgeting properly. Dave Ramsey in the Financial Peace University shows this graph between two guys he calls Ben and Arthur. Ben saves $2,000 a year, $166 a month. He saves it for, what, eight years and then stops. Doesn't put any more money in this. And if it re received a 12% return on that investment, which is probably not going to happen, but in the day that Dave wrote this, you were probably getting a good 12% return, but 12%, he didn't put another dime in it. Ben didn't put another dime after the first eight years of investment. And just the compound interest kept adding. He ends up at age 65 with $2.2 million. Now, Arthur doesn't start investing until he's 20, what, 27 years of age. But Arthur invests $2,000 a month from age 27 to age 65. I mean, look at the difference. He only ends up at age 65 with a million five hundred thousand. Both are rich. But one didn't procrastinate. The other one did. Made a whole lot more investment in money and in years. Got a whole lot less in return. About $700,000 less. I'm just telling. Procrastination hinders nearly every area of our life. It'll hinder your finances. It'll hinder your health. It'll hinder your... How about disciplining our children? Dare I? Disciplining our children. We, come on, all parents, we've all said, you know, everything from when you're going to wean a child off of breastfeeding to sleep training, that's a great one. Sleep training. You know our sleep training method? Have another kid, and that kid kicks the other one out of the bed, and they go to theirs. They may have another kid, and kicks that one out. That's what we did, because that's the way Starla wanted it. So uh, that's, that's, the way, that's the way we did it. The but discipline your children. I know plenty. So one of these days, we're going to make sure these kids, they all sit around the table. We have a family meal. We're going to have a family meal. We're going to do this right one of these days. When they get just a little bit older, or even coming back to church, you bring your kids. Or I'll get those kids back in church. When they get a little older, when they start behaving, we keep procrastinating, procrastinating, and procrastinating. How about making amends? We all we talk about, I'm, I'm going to make things right. I'm going to get things right with somebody. I'm going to, I'm going to say I'm sorry. I'm going to uh, make sure that I, I clear the air and we build that bridge back and we start making things right. Never do. We keep putting it off, putting it off, putting it off. Or how about developing our skills and hobbies and languages or interests? Every single one of us, we've got things that we would like to do with ourselves. We'd like to use our our abilities and, and become better at our jobs. And we think, one of these days, I'm going to get back to school. One of these days, I'm going to take that course. One of these days, I'm going to do this, but we don't. Or how about becoming a fully devoted follower of Christ? Yeah. What does that look like? I mean, I'm going to get in the word. I'm going to study the word. I'm going to become faithful in church. I'm going to serve somewhere. I'm going to start giving faithfully. I'm going to get in a fellowship group. I mean, in a small group, and I'm going to plug myself into the body of Christ. Well, procrastination has two big problems. Procrastination has two big problems. And the first is it gives this false sense of control. It makes you think that tomorrow is under your control. You have no control of tomorrow. You have no guarantee that tomorrow is actually going to come. You have no guarantee that where any of us are going to wake up in the morning because life is a game with a clock, but you can't see it. And you have no idea how fast the clock is ticking down. You have no idea how much more time you have. And whenever you procrastinate, you're putting faith in a tomorrow that may never be there. But let's assume that you do have control over tomorrow. 
Let's say you do. There's still another problem. And the other problem is that you don't know whether conviction will ever touch your heart again because procrastination ignores the timing of conviction. You see, there are certain times in our lives when the conviction is stronger than other times. There are certain times when people have to respond to what God is saying. They, they, just, they, they are compelled to respond, and other times you can just sit right through it. I watch it happen in nearly every service, nearly every Sunday. Some services, some people are under conviction. Some people feel compelled to respond, and some are like, whatever. Because the conviction is different for different people at different times. You may get it tomorrow, but there's no guarantee that your tomorrow come when it comes that you will be convicted in the way that you are today. It happened with Felix. Felix said, I'm going to send for you to a more convenient time. But the Bible never tells us that he ever made a decision to follow Christ. The Bible never tells us that he circled back around and he did what was right. The, the probable truth is is that he went into eternity lost. Here's what Isaiah 55, 6 says. Seek the Lord while he may be found. Call upon him while he is near. Seek the Lord while he is found. Call upon him while he is near. If you know that the Lord can be found today, then today is the day to call upon him. You see, your, your, your procrastination, it'll rob you of opportunities, but more important than anything, it'll rob you of your salvation. It'll rob you of eternity. It will rob you of a right relationship with Jesus Christ. You may say, well, isn't the Lord available at all times? Yes, the Lord is available at all times, but the conviction of the Holy Spirit is not the same each day. The conviction changes. That's why we have revivals that have swept through our nation, and we can refer back to seasons and times and years when the conviction of the Holy Spirit moved upon people in greater ways than it did in other times. So when is the best time to say yes to Jesus? When you know that you need Jesus. When's the best time to respond? When you know you need to respond. Because you are not guaranteed tomorrow. You're not guaranteed another day. You're not guaranteed another opportunity. When's the best time to say yes? When you know that you need Jesus. In fact, I want you to think about this just for a moment. The Bible tells us that today is the day of salvation. Why? Because God has a plan and a promise for each and every one of our lives, and he's counting on us to respond to that plan. And when we respond, we step into his perfect will. We step into what he has for us. And every day that we delay, every day that we procrastinate, every day that we put it off for a more convenient time, we're missing out on opportunities to experience his very best for us. Can God save us at the last minute? Yes. Can you be rescued in the nick of time? Yes. But who wants to take a chance on that? The best time to say yes to Jesus is when you feel his call, when you feel his nudge. It's the nudge of the Holy Spirit. It's the prompting of our Lord saying, today is the day of salvation. Today is the day to say yes. Today is the day to respond. Today is the day to hear his voice. Call on the Lord. Seek the Lord while he may be found. And I believe he's in this room today. I believe he's here right now. And I believe he's making himself available to each and every person today. Will you hear him? Will you follow after him? Will you seek him? Will you respond to him? Will you say yes to Jesus? I can remember when I finally committed my life to the Lord. The voice of the Lord was so clear on that day, and I knew that I had the responsibility, the awesome responsibility to say yes or to say no was to reject the voice of the Lord. I'm glad I said yes. I've been trying to say yes every day since. Haven't been perfect, but I say yes again today. And God's calling on each and every one of us to say yes to him. Don't put it off one more day. Don't put it off for a more convenient time. The most convenient time to respond to Jesus is today. The most convenient time to surrender to him is when you hear his voice.
when you hear the opportunity, when you hear him say, today is the day of salvation. Every single one of us are going to stand before God one day. As we stand before him, I believe we're going to see a reflection of ourselves. And when we see that reflection, you're going to either see a person that trusts in themselves and their ability, or you're going to see a person that trust completely upon our Lord Jesus Christ. When I look in that mirror, I know that I'm not good enough. I know that I can't do enough good deeds to be right with God. I know that I fall short of the holiness and the perfection of God. And there's no way I can even come close to that. I look in that mirror and I see a person in need of a savior. How foolish and how prideful I would be to think that I could make it a day on this earth or even a day in eternity on my own. I need a savior. And Jesus Christ became that savior. When I look in the mirror, I see a person that needs Jesus. And when you look in the mirror, I'm asking you today, do you see a person that needs Jesus or a person who trusts in himself for eternity? Because every single one of us here, just like Felix stood before Paul and told him there was a judge that was even bigger than him and that he would be held account for every action. Every single one of us will be held account for our actions. And I know that I've failed and I need Jesus. And when I accept him as my Lord, he forgives me of my sin. And I look in that mirror and I see me no more. I see Jesus and his forgiveness over my life. 